Hello and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa and this is episode 10. It's the end of December right now and so I hope everyone is having a great holiday season, whatever you may be celebrating this time of year. We just got done celebrating Christmas, so on Christmas Eve Frank and I had gone over to his mother's house and with her boyfriend we did the Feast of the Seven Fishes, spent the night there, and I was able to give her her Christmas present. So that brings me to my first finished object for today. I've talked about this in the last few episodes, but for her Christmas gift I made my mother-in-law the Sunset Rock cardigan by Lori Versace. I took some video of myself modeling it before I wrapped it up and gave it to her, which was a good thing because I totally forgot to get photos. We opened presents really late on Christmas Eve night and I was barely awake, let alone like cognizant enough to be able to take photos or video what was going on. Here you can see what it looks like on me. I have a 35 inch bust and this sweater has about 14 inches of positive ease on me so it is really an extreme drop shoulder. In the last episode I talked a little bit about how because it was so large on me and uh, my mother-in-law is approximately the same size as me so I usually just make things to fit myself and then I know that they'll fit her. In the last episode I talked a little bit about how I could tell that I was going to need to sort of finagle something at the armhole to have a more flattering fit at the underarm because the armhole was just going to be too large and any sleeve that would fit into an armhole that size was going to be a little bit too baggy based on where it was hitting on my upper arm. So I did end up sewing the armhole closed a little bit more which I showed in the last episode and then I picked up stitches around the armhole and knit the sleeves down so that I could make sure that they were really going to be the perfect length. The pattern is actually written to knit the sleeves from the bottom up and then sew them in so I just basically ignored that. I ignored almost everything actually about the sleeves that were written in the pattern. I just picked up the number of stitches that fit. I don't even remember how many I picked up, I just made sure to pick up the same amount on both sleeves and then just knit the sleeves down. Because I was using a superwash yarn for this project, the Malabrigo Arroyo, which is a sport weight, I did decide to make the sleeves a little bit short before blocking them. So the safest thing to do would have been to put them on waste yarn and then block and then if I liked that length then I would have bound off. But I have worked with this yarn enough to know what I needed to do there. And so I think the sleeves ended up being the perfect length. They were just a tad short before blocking and then after blocking they were perfect. So that is the Sunset Rock. It ended up looking perfect on my mother-in-law, which was really exciting. And we did give it to her with that pin that Frank picked out for her at Rhinebeck. And I was also modeling in the photos. So I really wanna get one of those for myself um, because I, I need something to hold shawls and to hold cardigans together, as you'll see in a minute when I talk about this one. This is my other finished object this episode. This is the Recoletta by Hohi Locatelli. Again, I've talked a lot about this one in previous episodes, so I'm not gonna go over all of the details about the construction, but I think the one major thing to note is that I used a very different yarn than the one called for in the pattern in terms of its behavior. The yarn called for in the pattern was a hand-dyed superwash worsted yarn, so it was very smooth. And the yarn that I chose to use is the Cascade 220 Worsted. This is the Mallard colorway. So even though I was switching out a worsted for a worsted, the Cascade is just a much more of a wooly wool. It's not wool and spun, I don't think. I'm fairly sure this is a worsted spun yarn, but it just doesn't drape as much as a superwash yarn will. And so what that has resulted in is that this collar sits up very high on my neck, which I actually really love because I'm always freezing. The other thing that I think this yarn choice really emphasizes is the texture in this lace pattern. This is, um, I don't think there are really any cables in here. I'm fairly sure this is just lace from what I remember. It's been, <laughs> it's been a couple weeks since I've worked on this now. The sort of grippiness of this yarn makes the texture have a little bit more depth because it's not, uh, the yarn isn't, relaxing and sort of stretching across my body, the lace has stayed sort of pulled in. And so when I was blocking it, I wanted to maintain that. So I didn't really stretch it out. I just soaked it with wool wash, spun the water out in my washing machine, and then laid it flat to dry. And I didn't do a whole lot of like pulling or shaping during the blocking process. As far as how I did the construction of this, it is a top down sweater. It's written to be top down. And I really wanted to use up as much of my yarn as I possibly could. I had five skeins, so that's 
1100 yards and I wanted to try to use all of it up. What I do in those instances is I will get to a certain point on the body, usually, you know, a couple inches below the sleeve separation, and then I will do both sleeves in full and then I'll go back and knit the body as long as I can with whatever is remaining. That is what I did with this and I ended up with about eight grams left over so that's pretty close to using up all five skeins. And I am pretty happy with the way this fits. I do think there is still a little bit too much fabric on the front, uh, this stockinette section between the collar and the actual underarm. I think there's just slightly too much fabric. But one thing that that enables me to do is really fully cross this panel in the front so that it, it overlaps totally. Uh, right now I'm holding this closed with a hair clip so I, you'll get to see that but there's a little bit too much fabric here but it's not it's not anything that is very offensive and it means that I can wear a normal t-shirt under here without this feeling too tight. So I am okay with how this fits. Um, if I were to really overlap this you can see the fit is almost perfect at the underarm. It is a raglan shoulder that starts pretty high up, which gives these nice raglan lines. And yeah, it's a really nice warm sweater because of how high it comes up. And I really, I like this color. It is not a color I usually wear, but I think I could get into it. So that is the Recoletta by Hohi Locatelli. Uh, like all of Hohi's patterns, it's beautifully written. So if you want to try a little bit more complicated lace. This lace is only worked on the right side, so you are only doing the yarn overs and the decreases on the right side of the fabric, and then the back side is just a series of knits and purls. So it is sort of an easier lace to tackle if you're looking to do something that is a little bit more of an involved, like longer lace repeat. But that still isn't anything too crazy or out there in terms of chart reading. That brings me to the one knitting whip that I have to share with you this week, which is the Oak Cardigan by Marie Wallen. The last time I showed this, I think it may have been two episodes ago, Ago, I was up to just under where I needed to figure out what to do about the armholes. And so I want to talk in a little bit more detail about my whole process around this garment because I have changed lots of things in terms of the construction. So this pattern is in her Wildwood book and just to give you an idea of what we we're talking about, it is this design. So slanted fronts on this cardigan, long sleeves, all over color work. This pattern is written to be knit flat. So you would knit your fronts separately, your back, and your two sleeves. You would knit them all flat, meaning uh, you're working all in stockinette color work, but on the wrong side, you would read your chart backwards and be purling in color work. Um, and that is just not my favorite process. I gave it a try on the boho sweater that I talked about last week and in previous episodes. And although I got to a point where I didn't hate it, it's just not my favorite thing. And knitting five separate rather large pieces in color work knitted flat was just not something that I was really excited about doing. So I decided to convert this pattern to be knit in the round and I've had a couple requests to talk about exactly what I did to figure that out and so I will tell you. I have the body done so let me just show that to you. So here it is. <laughs> Won't even fit on the camera. So what I ended up doing, this is knit from the bottom up and as you can see I have steaks for the armholes right here. Uh, this is my side seam. I added a little purl stitch, which you can probably barely see right here. And I added a steak up the front, since this is a cardigan, which is right along here. So to figure this out, I did a little bit of writing down some numbers and drawing some diagrams in my notebook. So let's say the pattern says for you to cast on 50 stitches for each front and 100 for the back. Ordinarily, when you are, are seaming a garment, you have one stitch on either side of each body piece that's going to be taken up with either the seam at the side or if you are at the front of the garment, you're going to be picking up stitches for your button band or your collar or whatever you're doing along uh, one that first stitch on the front. So if I wanted this to fit exactly exactly the way the one 
in the book fits. I would have subtracted out those stitches from the front and from the side, but it's not so close fitting that I thought those stitches were gonna matter. So what I did to get this started, because I was knitting the ribbing at the bottom flat, and I, I didn't start my steek until after this hem ribbing was done. So here is where my steek starts, right at the color work. So what I did for my cast on was, I cast on, and these are made up numbers, but just to illustrate the point, say I cast on 50 stitches for the front, 100 for the back, and then another 50 for the other front. I worked this hem ribbing, which is a corrugated rib, which is actually pretty cool, two color corrugated rib, so you can see the, uh, the brown yarn is the pearl stitch. And so I knit this flat, just this rib. Then when it came time to start the color work, I added the steek at the front. So when it was time to start the color work, I knitted around, I cast on, I decided to use seven stitches for my steek. So I cast on seven stitches and the, it was pretty easy with this first round because it was just this chestnut color, no color work yet. So I was able to just cast on seven stitches for the steek and then join in the round and start working the color work. So I had my two stitch markers here marking this steek. On that first round, I also added one stitch at each side to be this faux pearl stitch. And so I just simply, when I got to this point, I just increased a stitch and put a stitch marker on either side of it. And so that made my life a lot easier in terms of being able to read the charts as written in the pattern because the charts are marked off for each size based on the stitch counts that are written in the pattern, of course, for my size as if it was worked flat. And so I didn't want to screw around with trying to subtract out a stitch or like remember that I was not doing one stitch on either end or whatever. I just wanted to read the charts as is. So by that point with this example, I had 202 stitches for the body of the sweater plus seven steek stitches for that front. So 209 stitches total. Because of the way the front of this cardigan is shaped where there's an amount of color work just worked as is and then decreases start for the front to create this long sloping opening, I knit the color work as written just around and around no decreases until about this point which is where in the pattern as written flat you would start decreasing along each front so you would start creating that slope on each side. So instead of binding stitches off like you would in the pattern, I just did some decreases, right and left leaning decreases um, with a knit two together and a slip slip knit. And so that is how the front of the cardigan got shaped along the steek. The shape of this, you can see how the color work sort of looks like it starts to angle down in sort of a very gradual V and that's because of those decreases at the front. So when I cut this open, those lines aren't going to necessarily slant down like that. That is just uh, the way that it is laying right now because I did those decreases and it's still all in one piece. The last time I showed this to you, I was right about here. So right before starting the underarm shaping for this. And this is a true set in sleeve. So finally, after all of my like sleeve screwing around of the last couple episodes, um, we have a true set and sleeve shape here where you bind off some amount of stitches for the underarm and then you do some sloping decreases here and then you knit straight up and then there's some shoulder shaping here. One option at that point would have been to knit flat just from here up, which would have been a little bit more bearable than knitting the entire thing flat. But what I decided to do was add another steek. You can see that there's a hole here. And that is because I had to cast off a certain number of stitches here that were larger than the number of stitches I wanted to include in my steek. So again, I used a seven stitch steek here. And so what I did was when I got to this point in the pattern, I cast off whatever the recommended number of stitches was. Let's say it's seven on the front and seven on the back. So I cast off those 14 stitches along here plus the fake purl stitch that I had added. So I actually cast off 15 stitches. And then on the next time around, I cast on my seven stitches and started my new steek. 
and then I did the decreases here in the same way as I did on the front. So the decreases along the side of the steak create this nice little sloped shaping here. And then from this point on, when the, uh, when the shaping and the pattern stopped, I just knit it straight. You can see that there is some sloped shoulder shaping here, which is really nice. This is going to give a nice fit on the body, but I had to cast off my steak first, so that is what I did. And you can see, I'm just sticking my finger through it to illustrate the point, but I just cast off these seven stitches and... From this point on, I did knit these couple of rows here, uh, so from about here up, is worked flat. And that wouldn't have been so bad if I didn't get the bright idea to also try to do German short rows in this, along this bind off area, because these are short rows. Everything from here up is, is either a short row or if you were doing it as the pattern suggested, you'd be binding off along this edge. And I had decided to, instead of binding off, to do short rows. So I really wouldn't recommend that and I won't be doing it again because it was just too much to manage with all of these color changes in the middle of it. Um, I have done short rows in flat color work before on my yell, uh, my yell cardigan, but that was only two colors at a time and this was really irritating to do. Yeah, there's at least six colors going on in this area from here up and I found it to be really irritating but by that point I was in the middle of it and I had just like made my choice and decided to go with it. It ended up working out um, but next time I'm just going to knit that flat and, and like bind off as the pattern suggests. Knitting the section flat also ended up giving me all of these incredibly annoying ends um, and you get ends at both <laughs> both sides uh, because of where you are changing colors sometimes you you would end up changing on the wrong side row so it just it was super annoying I have already woven in a bunch of my ends here but it uh, it really created a mess I will definitely just be binding off next time while you're shaping this slope with the short rows you're also doing a little bit of binding off for this front neckline so you might notice a little something. Uh, it's probably a little bit hard to see since this is still in one piece, but I screwed up the shaping on the front of this. And I didn't notice until I was at the point where I had completely finished the back. The shoulders of the back were on holders, like waiting for the three needle bind off. And I was working the front up and I looked at it and I was like, that looks slightly bigger than the back. So the back by this point had 30 stitches for each shoulder and the front had 40. And I was like, what happened? So I looked back in the pattern and like, that's the thing when you start screwing around with patterns, if you are not really double checking yourself and like really counting your stitches up and double checking to make sure that you didn't do anything wrong, it's really easy to just miss something. And sure enough, there was one instruction that's, that I missed that was to continue decreasing up the front. Like for whatever reason, I just, stopped doing it and didn't think anything of it at the time. And so you can sort of see that my decreases here are continuing, continuing, continuing up the front. And then here I just stopped doing them for some reason and they should have continued. So what this resulted in was that I had 10 more stitches on each front than I should have. And this shaping of this front should have continued to go like this. All of the fabric between here and the steak should not be there. So when I realized what had happened, I was like, mother <laughs> And I considered ripping it back because I would only have had to rip back to here and just knit this, the, you know, this section again. But I had just gotten done with like hours of screwing around with doing these stupid short rows on the back and I was like what if I just cut it out because I'm cutting this anyway right I'm sticking up the front anyway there's no reason that I can't just when I'm cutting my steak if I can just sort of gracefully figure out where it was I should have been still decreasing I mean it, there are 10 more decreases that need to happen here I'll just cut this V out so that's my plan I 
am in a little bit of a pickle here because I am running very low on some of these colors. Like if that doesn't work and I screw this up and somehow have to figure out how to redo the top of this sweater, I am for sure not gonna have enough yarn and I would have to order more. So I really don't wanna screw this up. So before I steek, I think I'm going to pick up the stitches for the front bands, like the way that I want them to be coming down from the shoulder and just see if I can do it in a way that looks okay. It's not going to look as clean as when I pick them up alongside this steek because this whole body of the sweater has these really nice um, sloping decreases here and then all of a sudden they're gonna stop. So that's a little bit irritating uh, that this isn't gonna be as perfect as it could be but you know I need to get a grip sometimes and this does sort of provide an interesting chance to experiment here so that I'm gonna pick up the stitches see if I can do it in a way that looks good and if that does look good then I will just cut this off this is an instance where I am going to use my sewing machine to reinforce the steak before I cut it usually I will do that by hand or like with a crochet hook but because I am sort of now going off the path with my steaking at the neck. And this yarn is actually a worsted spun yarn. So this is uh, Marie Wallen's British Breeds. It is her yarn that she had designed and spun by John Arbin. And the colors are absolutely incredible. It is fuzzy, like you can see that there's a little bit of a halo. I'm not quite sure how they're accomplishing that because the John Arbin mill is a worsted mill, but the yarn isn't super smooth like a sock yarn or anything. If I hadn't screwed up the front shaping of this, I would probably just go with the crochet stabilization like I usually do, or I would just cut it like this. Feels like it's making a really nice solid fabric. I don't, I'm not worried about this unraveling. Like it's not a super smooth yarn. Like the, the fabric along where I have done all of these decreases, the decreases give it a little bit of stability that this area up here when I'm just cutting into the body of the sweater is not gonna have. I just wanna give myself the best uh, chance of success <laughs> there. So I will probably use my sewing machine to reinforce that. So here's a nice little shot of the back. This has been blocked and you can see the chart is just super long, which is really nice because you don't get tired of doing any of this color work because you only repeat the chart like once, not even a full time. Um, so it starts here at the bottom and then you don't repeat it again until here. Yeah, here. So it's a nice long, I mean it's 80 something rows long. And there are 10 different colors in the sweater. So I've been fully entertained the whole time and it's going by really fast because it's like anything else where you just want to get to the next row and keep seeing the pattern develop, you know? So steaking this is next on my list. The other major change that I made, which is uh, probably more of a major change than what I did on the body, is I am also knitting the sleeves in the round uh, and steaking them, and I'm knitting them at the same time. So here is what that looks like. This looks like one sleeve to you uh, right now, but it's actually both sleeves. So they're conjoined with two steaks. So here is steak number one. <laughs> it's not easy to show you this for some reason. Um, here we go. Here's steak number one. And here's steak number two. So I did this in the same way as I did the body where I cast on for these sleeve cuffs and I knit each one of them flat, and then I joined the sleeves in the round by adding seven stitches here, knit around, and added the other seven stitches there. And so, why did I decide to do this? It does seem like the path of least resistance, if I was changing everything anyway, would be to pick up the stitches around the top of the sleeve and knit the sleeves down. But, what that does is it turns the direction of the stitches around. So where you can see, you know, if we look at these stitches here, you can see all of these stitches are a V facing up like this, right? If I were to pick up the stitches at the top of the sleeve and knit the sleeves from the top down, all of the stitches would be shaped like this. 
and it does change the look of the pattern. It's a minor thing and you definitely can't tell from a distance. It's really not that big of a deal, like a lot of Fair Isle sweaters are traditionally done that way, but for this one I just, just didn't want to do it that way. I wanted to try something new, knit it from the bottom up. So then the question might be, why did I not knit them individually in the round from the bottom up and then just attach them to the shoulders? And the reason I did not do that is because I don't like the jog that would happen at the change of the round. So if I were knitting the sleeves from the bottom up, at that point where I would change colors or change rounds, there would be a jog. And I have definitely done like a jogless stripe before, but I'm not sure how that would work in an all over color work situation like this where you're sometimes changing multiple colors each round and like the, the potential for that being a mess. If I were trying to figure out a jogless situation there, I'm not sure how that would turn out. It could work, but I don't know. With this sort of conjoined sleeve option, which I learned about from the Mary Scott Huff blog, I'll link it below. She is an incredible writer and is super knowledgeable about especially all things color work. I had first read about this on her blog and decided to give it a try. So what is going to happen is I will cut this, I'll cut these steaks, and then when I seam the sleeves together I can exactly match up the pattern on each side, at least in theory, if I take my time with the seaming like I should. I mentioned before that this is a set in sleeve and I had gotten really hung up on the directions for the set in sleeve, uh, really questioning them because with the way the set in sleeve is shaped, you can see it's it's like a bell curve, you know, you don't end up with the same number of pattern rows on the sleeve cap as you do on the body. And that was really throwing me. So you can see here on the body, I ended up in this white section, the white section with X's and flowers. And on the sleeve, I am really not, uh, it looks like I should just be able to keep going um, until this will exactly match this. But with the way the set in sleeve is shaped, I'm actually going to be stopping on a, somewhere around this pattern row on the sleeve and then the top of the sleeve will get eased into the top of the body. So it was really throwing me that this white section was going to be up against like a dark brown section on the sleeve. But I do think that the drafting is correct in the pattern because what would happen if you did knit your sleeve cap to be exactly to the same row as on your body, once you fit that sleeve into this uh, sleeve opening, armhole opening, it would create like a big 40s style shoulder if you had the sleeve cap knitted to this same depth. And I could see that, so there are hardly any of these projects on Ravelry, but some of the other patterns in the book have a lot of projects on Ravelry and they're also a set in all over color work design. And I could see that some people had done that and it does create like a very square shoulder, which is fine if that's the look you're going for but it's not necessarily the look I was going for on this. It's been really like a couple days of deliberating and going back and forth in my mind and talking with my friend and <laughs> all kinds of questioning of the pattern to come to the conclusion that actually I think the pattern is fine. I was convinced that it was not right and I had to look at it about five or six different times like on different days to to get to the point where I think actually it is fine. <laughs> It's right. I should just trust Marie Wallen. She knows what she's doing. So now that I have come to that conclusion that Marie Wallen does indeed know what she's doing, um, I can finish the top of this, which I think I could probably do today. And then I'm going to steak. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of steaking and a lot of finishing on this thing. So I will plan to video my steaking. So if I screw this up, you will be able to see it. And uh, I'll report back. I've also been doing some swatching for some upcoming projects and I am really excited about how two of them turned out. One of them is just a complete bust, so I am scrapping that one, but I'll show you the others. Well, I'll show you all three. The first one is my swatch for my Vare sweater by Gudrun Johnston, which I had bought the yarn for at Rhinebeck this year and I showed the yarn in my Rhinebeck video. 
And here is, I just swatched the color work, which is at the top of the sweater. So the bottom of the sweater is some multicolored razor shell. I am very happy with how this turned out. I'm getting gauge. The yarn that I'm using as the contrast color is thicker than the yarn I'm using for the background color. And it is creating a sort of interesting feel. You can't really tell that they're a different texture, I don't think, but it's not affecting the gauge at all. It just feels a little bit thicker in the contrast color areas. But you can see I tried out two different color browns. Originally, I wanted to use this darker brown because I think in terms of the overall palette, it's sort of a more pleasing color when the yarns are laid out next to each other. But you really can't see it against this background, which is a super dark green. And, you know, it looks fine when you're up close. I mean, fine-ish. It's still really... This is just not, it's, there's not enough contrast between these two yarns here, but when it comes away, like you really can't see it. And so what would happen if I went with that yarn is that all you would see in this color work section is this yellow. So I dug around in my stash and I found, I had so much yarn left over from that Bohu sweater that I am going to use one of the browns from that. And it's subtle, it's a subtle difference but it makes a big difference when the, the color work is a little bit further away. Yeah, so here was the original choice, and then here is the one that I ended up going with. So it's amazing, like it, this yarn actually has a lot of lighter grayish tones to it, so I thought it might work, but it just unfortunately doesn't, and I need to just accept that. So this one I think I am going to cast on I'll probably cast this on as soon as I finish knitting the top of that sleeve so that I have something else going on and not just finishing work on the Marie Wallen sweater. The other successful swatch was for the Koyame pattern by Joanna Eng. I'll try to take some video during the day so you can actually see what this looks like, but it's made with that new Tiden yarn, which is some unspun roving just off the card. So this uh, comes like this, I'm sure that you have probably seen it on other podcasts. And this is actually um, a stage in yarn production where after it is cleaned and uh, picked and has gone through the card, it comes off of the card like this. And so for woolen spun yarns, this would go to another machine and it would be spun right off of these little wheels. So this is sort of what happens during one stage of woolen spun yarns. And so you can just knit with this stuff. It is very delicate. It will just pull apart if you want to pull it apart. I didn't have any trouble with that when I was knitting the swatch. But my big issue with this yarn is I wanted to find the right mohair to go with it because this is exactly what's called for in the pattern uh, as far as one of the yarns to be held together, but you are supposed to hold it together with mohair. And I didn't have anything in my stash that complemented this. This is just a natural sheep brown, like a natural dark brown. It's got um, a light gray hair here and there running through it. And I find this to be a little bit of a difficult color. Um, this is one, I, this is what was available when I went to order yarn from them. Like I just happened to catch the tail end of an update and it would not have been my first choice, but I was interested to try it. And I do like the natural colors, but my first instinct was to try to find like a brownish or a grayish mohair to hold with it. And I could tell because I have a few of those in my stash and when I was holding them together, it's like, the trouble with this color is that I just felt like I was going to look like I'm wearing a merkin on my upper body, frankly. Like, it's just, I don't know. It's, uh, it's beautiful, but it really needed the correct color mohair to be paired with it in order to have it be, like, nice looking and not looking like I'm wearing a bear costume. I looked around a lot online to try to find something that would pair well with this and I was just really struggling to tell whether it was going to look good. And I had identified a few different colors but I really wanted to be able to see them in person. 
So I ended up making a trip to Webs. Webs, uh, I'm sure a lot of folks in the US have heard of them. Their website is yarn.com, which is genius. And they do a lot of online sales, but they also have a physical location, which is about a little over an hour from where I live. So I do have to like make a plan if I'm gonna go there, but I've been there a few times and it does not disappoint if you are especially into commercial yarns. They have such a wide variety from all of the bigger brands and some smaller brands, but like you can really see all of the interesting stuff that some of these larger distributors are doing and it's nice to see it in person. Originally I was planning on getting sort of like a dark wine color of the Barocco Ariel, which I had seen in person, but not in that colorway. And I just wanted to be able to take this yarn and like put it next to the mohairs and see which one was gonna be the best. So when I got to Webbs and I made my way over to where this mohair was and I picked it up, it was very dull. So with some mohairs, they're, the core of the yarn is like very, very shiny. And um, that is sort of what I was looking for because this yarn is also very dull in terms of the, the finish of it. It's a very, it's not shiny, it absorbs light. And so I wanted to get a shiny mohair, as, as shiny of a mohair as I could to pair with it because I thought that that would, it's gonna bring out the texture of the cable pattern on the sleeve of this sweater, which ordinarily might be a little bit hard to see in such a dark yarn. So the color of the Barocco was perfect as far as what I was envisioning, but it was very dull and I, wasn't anticipating that. So it sort of threw me a little bit and I started looking around at the other brands. Valley Yarns, which I think is Webb's own brand, has a mohair called Southampton and that stuff is actually very high quality. It is very inexpensive and I really like that stuff. I've used it before. And so I went over there to see what colors they had. I absolutely would have used that yarn. I would have preferred to use that if they had the color that I wanted. Their range of reds and purples, it's like none of them were exactly quite right, but the the shininess and like the quality of that mohair would have been perfect. So then of course I start looking around and they had some Shibui sitting there and like this stuff is expensive. It is, I mean, it's extremely high quality, it is, but is it worth the significant price increase? I am not entirely sure this is the color i ended up choosing which is bordeaux and it does i mean you can see the core of this yarn is very shiny and i'm in a super low light situation right now but this was the one that was going to work out the best for this project in terms of color and the the appearance of it how it's going to play off of this the other brand that i didn't think about checking out um, i mean there's no way for me to see it in person because i'm not going to new york but the pearl soho brand mohair I suspect is spun at the same place in Japan um, just based on the appearance and also the the put up so this um, this mohair comes in 330 yard skeins and I think the Pearl Soho mohair is 328 yards or something similar and it appears it just appears like visually very similar to this so and it's less expensive than the Shibui so if anybody has tried that let me know uh, let me know what you think of it in the comments. I saw that they were having a sale and I was like, oh, I want to try that mohair, but I I really don't need more mohair right now. Like I've got enough for my project, so I, I decided I needed to chill, but I'll show you my failed swatch too. Why not? So this was for the Muru pullover, which is a relatively new design by Sari Nordland. And the yarn I used for this is who, I think it's called the Broco Lana. It's a worsted weight. I would say you could probably use it for worsted or Aran garments. It comes in a lot of nice heathered colors. It's just sort of like a workhorse type yarn. It's a Cascade 220 type. And I chose these three colors to start, which are sort of a light minty green, this purple, and this is actually a navy. And it is just not, like the colors are not playing together like I thought they would. I mean, I was a little bit worried that the navy was going to be too dark, and it is. With this pattern being all over the sweater, I think it's just gonna be a little bit too much. Like I need to take the navy out and maybe, I'm sort of thinking I need to change the main color of the sweater. Like if I were to do a very light gray as the main color and then have 
these two be the contrast colors that might work but then I also think I'm going to run into a problem with this green being too light and here is my attempt to test <laughs> to see I had sort of a medium gray this is some Patton's uh, worsted wool like you can just get at any big box store in the US I actually really like this stuff for a lot of things and so I had leftovers from a hat that I had made and I just decided to swatch for color and see what happened and that is even worse it's just not not working out so I think the Muru pullover is just gonna have to go on the back burner until I get the colors worked out it's not I'm not really like chomping at the bit to start that one so it's fine I have plenty of other things in my queue and this can just be like a little lesson to trust my gut like when I was buying these colors in the store I was like yeah, I'm taking a chance here and it just didn't work out <laughs> so I don't know I I don't want to say I shouldn't take chances but I uh, I should trust my gut when it comes to something like this that is all of the knitting content that I have for you today but I do want to take a couple minutes to tell you about my experience at wool classing school last month I attended a wool classing school put on by the American Sheep Industry Association this class happened out in uh, southern like southwestern North Dakota so I flew from Boston to Minneapolis to Bismarck North Dakota and then it was about a two and a half hour drive to get to where the class was being held so the class was limited to 10 wool classers and then it was going on at the same time as a sheep shearing school where people were actually learning to shear and there were maybe 25 or 30 shearers it was held at an old uh, National Guard armory so it had sort of been turned into a rec center for the town so the the town it was held in was very small like population less than 2,000 people so it was like a little rec center with a cafeteria and they clearly hold a lot of events there and then there was a big hoop barn out back which was where the sheep were actually being shorn and so this was also being put on in conjunction with North Dakota State University and they have an agriculture program there and so these sheep actually belonged to the university the class was three pretty full days and so we were sort of separated from the shearing for part of the day and then we would go down and actually work with the shearers for the second half of the day so the first half of the day was a lot of instruction we had two main instructors and we learned so much about fiber production as in like the way it grows off the sheep like the actual biology of it we learned about how any stressors in a, a sheep's life can really affect the quality of the wool that they produce and so in a lot of ways it's comforting to know that it's in everybody's interest for animals to be raised in the most caring and humane way possible because any stressors on the sheep during the period of that wool fibers growth can actually affect the strength of the fiber i'm not talking about like an abuse situation but even you know if a sheep happens to get sick lambing is something that's very um, stressful on the ewe and so that that can also cause a weak spot in the fiber because nutrients are being taken up elsewhere so all of that was fascinating I have textbooks I have my preparation of wool clips my certified wool classer manual which is uh, significant there were two written tests that we had to do before we could leave so I haven't found out whether I passed yet but we'll we'll see a lot of the instruction was hands-on so because this class was being put on by the American sheep industry the sort of lens of this class was commercial wool production like not small farm stuff and I had been exposed to small farm wool production and like small mill stuff out here in New England there's a lot of that but I had never really seen the scope of what the commercial wool industry is like in the US because all of that happens out west the climate is better for it and um, the land is out there I had never really been exposed to this prior to this class and it really expanded my vision of what I think of when I think of the wool industry like I think we especially as end users of these products like these yarns that are made can get very into like our own little world of what's on Instagram or what's being shown on a YouTube podcast or what is available in our local yarn store and we don't think about like there are people 
running thousands and thousands of sheep in these flocks out west that are being used for commercial wool production for yarns that go into military uniforms and things like that like it the the vastness of the scope was like it really hit me almost immediately as soon as i started learning and also like seeing what was going on the sheep that we were dealing with in the class were mostly rambouillet uh, there were also some Columbias. There were probably about 350 or 400 of them. So the wool classers did our classroom learning in the morning and then in the late morning or in the afternoon we would go down and work with the shearers. So the shearers were an incredible group of people. Um, that work is so difficult. It is so difficult and to be able to do it well is an art form I think. The sheep are huge. I mean Rambouillets are not small. You see somebody who knows what they're doing like one of the instructors of the class and it's like they're doing a dance with the sheep and the sheep is calm and it's all over in a really short period of time and the sheep is on their way and it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. So there were eight shearing stations. There were maybe sh three shears to a station and there were lots of instructors around. So anytime someone got in a pickle with, you know, not having a sheep positioned the right way, there was an instructor there to help them figure out what to do. And a lot of the people who were in the class were people who are actually shearing now as their work, but they were coming back to the class as sort of uh, continuing education because in the shearing world you get paid by the head. And so it's in your best interest to be able to do it quickly and also efficiently and with as little strain on either you or the animal as possible. You know, there might have been people there who were regularly doing 90 sheep a day who wanted to move up to doing 120 a day and like how can I get more efficient in my movements, things like that. So our job at that point was to collect the fleeces as they were coming off the shearing floor, um, throw them out on, we had two big sorting tables, skirt them, as quickly and efficiently as we could and class the fleece. And so the first day that we were down there, the person who was teaching us how to class was incredible. He's somebody who's worked in the industry for decades and you hear about people who can tell the difference in, you know, half a micron between one fleece and another and this this is one of those guys. The first day moved a little bit more slowly because the shearers were also moving a little bit more slowly and so we had more time to you know, we would all stand around a fleece and we'd pull off a sample and talk about, you know, the length and the quality and whether it was tender or not and all of the things to look for and then decide how it should be graded within a certain scale without getting too far into it. Like there's a number of different ways you can classify a fleece based on its quality essentially. And so you want to keep the high quality fleeces together so that they don't get diluted by lesser quality fleeces when you're talking about the volume that we were dealing with there. So we had about four different categories that we were grading into and we had to make those decisions about every 20 seconds. Uh, because by that time there was another fleece that needed to be put out on the table. So the first day was a little bit slower paced and then the second day when we showed up down there uh, you know, we sort of all were expecting it to be the same thing where we could sort of ask our instructor, well, what do you think of this one is? Like, I think it's a grade A2, what do you think? And he was like, go for it. Like, go ahead and class them. And so we were all like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, but we got into it. I mean, everybody was so just passionate, passionate about the animals, passionate about the quality of the fleece and really learning and really feeling and exploring and like absorbing as much information as we possibly could. We were just getting dirty, like it was great. It was it was life affirming, honestly. I loved every single second of it. There was some good drinking and talking that happened at the bar after the class and it was just, it was great. The last day we had a little uh, hands-on test that was set up for us by the instructor. The prior day he had picked out, I think there were 14 or 15 different fleeces that he had picked out as examples for our test the following day. And so all these fleeces were just sitting out on some tables with like numbers, you know, on pieces of paper in front of them. We had to go around and identify the grade, whether it was double A, A, A1, A2, A4, whatever. Yeah, God, we actually had like maybe six different grades going. Yeah. So we had to choose a grade. We had to say what length we thought it was because there's a, a length that's optimal for a traditional mill situation. If it's above or below that, you might class it differently. So grade, length, and micron count. And all we had were our fingers. I think I got 13 out of 15 right. And by right, I mean he went around with us after we had all made our observations and he did his own sample and 
said what he thought it was. We did have a machine there where we could measure the actual micron count. So it was interesting to see whether our physical estimation was in the ballpark, and which it was uh, the vast majority of the time. And I mean, a sheep's fleece can also vary in micron count throughout the fleece, depending on where you pick out that sample from. So it's not an exact science at all. It's also not something that would ever happen in a real world situation. You would never have a machine there measuring as the fleece are coming off of the sheep. So it was sort of just an interesting thing to have, but not applicable to the real world. So when you're dealing with a certain breed of sheep or a certain like range of quality of fleeces, it's amazing how quickly you can get to the point where you can really tell this one is particularly fine. I would call this 18 microns or this one feels slightly coarser this is maybe more of like a 22, 23. And it doesn't take very long to really get to that point. I don't know that my assessment now, you know, a month later, like I might have a harder time getting back to that place because it's all relational. Like once you feel a bunch of 19 micron fleeces, you get used to what that feels like. And then you can easily tell in that moment what's finer and what's coarser. You know, we did make this at one point in the class, which are samples of fleece by fineness. And so I can continue to train my fingers with these raw fleece samples, which is cool. All right, it is getting dark and the dog needs to go outside. So I think it's time for me to stop talking about wool and uh, get on with it. But I will see you very soon. And I hope that everyone has a great start to 2022. I mean, let's do this, right? So please take care. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.